Thank you. That's wonderful. We're taping at the Blue Building. And the guest of honor tonight is Joshua Monk, who is a Johns Hopkins professor. Give a big hand for him. And he's, he's also the founder of a really interesting online platform magazine uh, called Persuasion. And his latest book is The Identity Trap, a story of ideas and power in our time. And I don't know if anybody out there is an academic or an intellectual. A couple people, you know, mildly raising their hands. Uh, one thing that's great about this book is that if you believe in ideas, uh, he really demonstrates and documents that they matter, which is kind of nice to hear, right? You should hope so, for sometimes perhaps it would be better if ideas mattered less than they do. That's right. Okay, but uh, Yasha Monk, uh, thanks for coming out, and let's start, uh, give me the elevator pitch of uh, the identity trap. Well, the elevator pitch is that, uh, you know, there's a new set of ideas about race, gender, and sexual orientation that has become really influential over the last decade. Uh, and in the public debate about it, I think there's this weird tension where uh, on the right, they're sometimes attacked as destroying everything that's good and holy. Uh, and sometimes people invoke terms like woke or critical race theory to talk about sensible things like recognizing that there's still discrimination and sexism and racism in our society or wanting to teach kids about the history of injustices in the United States like slavery. And then on, 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 on the left and in the mainstream, among many of my friends and colleagues, in response, there's this sort of suggestion that there's really nothing to see here. That certainly to say you're woke is just to... Um, you know, be nice and sensible and, and want to see reality. And there's really, you know, the, the claim that the norms that organizations are run by in the United States have changed is just, is just wrong. And there's nothing ideologically new about what's happening on the left. And so what I try to set out to do in this book is to actually understand what I think is a genuinely novel ideology. An ideology that has an intellectual history of its own, that arose in universities in the United States and other countries, and that then through a series of interesting mechanisms came to have this powerful influence on our society. And I think that those ideas deserve to be taken seriously um, and then critiqued. Um, and so that's what I do. In the first part of the book, I tell the, the story of where these ideas come from in the academy. Let's, let's start with that. Um, you call this new set of ideas uh, that have power, that have you know, kind of taken over uh, by your telling, and I think by many people's, you know, certain, the C-suites of certain types of corporations, certainly the academy, increasingly different parts of American life. Um, you call that the identity synthesis. Can you describe what is the identity synthesis? Yeah, so first of all, we just need a damn term to refer to this ideology. <laughs> you know, like, and you're, like, you, you, you don't want to say, oh, this is wokeness no, or I, political No, I think, I think all, yeah, all of those terms that we have are just very politically charged, right? So socialism, some people love socialism, probably most people in this room don't like socialism, but we can all agree to call it socialism, right? Um, we need a term so we can discuss in a serious and neutral way this body of ideas. And woke is not going to do it because it makes you sound like you're an old man shouting at the clouds. Okay. So, uh, so uh, I call ageist. it the identity synthesis. You're ageist. I'm ageist. That's, yes, okay. I confess And that's a to dangerous my... place to be in contemporary America. <laughs> the last time I checked, you know, don't trust anybody under 80 seems to be the government. <laughs> Um, long list our gerontocracy. Um, so, so I think, look, these ideas are uh, fundamentally concerned with a role that group identities do and should play in our society. And they are a synthesis of different intellectual influences, in particular postmodernism, postcolonialism, and critical race theory. And so that's why I call it the identity synthesis. So call it whatever you want, call it the thing, if we can just have a word that allows us to have a serious conversation about okay, this topic. Let's, uh, let's start with those kind of uh, three tributaries. Um, how are you defining postmodernism in this context? Yeah, so, uh, and, and I know I'm dangerous ground here because Nick is a deeply paid up postmodernist. So oh, he's yeah. going to come at me from... I the, go to all the meetings. Yeah, from the, from the, he's going to come at me from a postmodernist center. Yeah. 
Um, so, uh, look, the first point to make about the intellectual history is that this is not cultural Marxism. Um, so that is, you know, basically very few people have tried to tell the story of these ideas, and the ones who have are mostly right-wing polemicists who've said this is cultural Marxism. And I have various problems with that. One of them is that taking uh, economic categories like social class out of Marxism is a little bit like saying you've taken the bat out of baseball. Mm. There's just not very much left. Um, You're describing both the New York Yankees and the New York Mets, by the way. <laughs> um, uh, and it's just wrong as a matter of intellectual history. If you think of this as a form of cultural Marxism, you're not going to understand the themes that dominate our politics today. So uh, I think the starting point of his ideology lies uh, specifically with Michel Foucault. Mm -hmm. And Foucault is you know, raised by people who have these grand theories about how the world works. First, a Hegelian uh, teacher of his and then a Marxist teacher of his, but he rejects those grand narratives about the world, including both liberalism um, and uh, Marxism. Um, he makes the argument that our belief in any form of objective truth or our belief in any form of real progress is illusionary. We might think we treat the mentally ill or the or criminals or other people better in 1950s France than we did 100 or 200 years ago. That's all bunk. It turns out to be wrong. But the really influential point he makes is about the nature of political power. And what he says is that you know, when we think of power, when you ask uh, you know, a, a high school civics uh, student what power is. They might say, well, it's sort of top down, right? It's like there's the state and we pass some laws and then the police and the bureaucracy is sort of implemented in some way, right? And says, no, power in the most important sense is we are exercising power right now on stage by the way we frame things, by the way we talk about things, right? Power is this discursive process where everybody exercises power over each other. And as a result, to oppose power is to recognize these discourses, to critique them, but you can never really make progress because the moment you've dismantled one discourse, another one arises, and that's going to be as oppressive as the one I, that went before. I thank you for that. And you also quote, of course, uh, Leotard's uh, very you know, kind of foundational uh, definition of postmodernism as incredulity toward meta narratives. Um, the one thing, and I, this isn't about postmodernism, but it's interesting to think about people like Foucault. I've talked and written about this. From a libertarian perspective, when you look at his work, particularly in the 70s and 80s, he got to a point where he was telling his students in, in uh, Paris to read Mises and Hayek um, and to t look at liberalism, uh, et cetera. So it's interesting to think about him. And also, you know, part of what you do in the book, which I think is really important, is that you also talk about how these ideas have real credence. When uh, Foucault was critiquing the medicalization of everyday life and of uh, society, you know, at the same time that somebody like Thomas Saz was doing here, or the sociologist Irving Goffman, it was a moment when people were like, you know what, like psychiatry and psychologizing everything, maybe that's a means of social control. It's not just a, you know, like, oh, you know, medical professionals want to help people. Sometimes they're putting people away. You can argue that it went too far or that itself was wrong. But there was a compelling understanding of a lot of these big theories of history. And, you know, in France in the 60s, Marxism, certainly, maybe not liberalism, but it had, it had failed, right? Yeah, and, and, and I think, you know, my, my, probably my, my, my favorite section in the entire book comes at the end of part one, at the end of where I tell this intellectual history, and it's called Careful What You Wish For. Mm. Because I think that Foucault has all of the tools to criticize the moment we're in today. He says, you know, he's a homosexual or somebody who's gay in our terms. He's a man who had sex with men. He rejected that term because he thought it was too essentializing, too simplifying, too constraining of a variety of sexual experiences. His most famous metaphor is that of a panopticon, which he gets from James Mill, the idea that an efficient prison would be one in which the guard stands in the middle in a watchtower, and he might, in theory, be looking into any uh, prison cell at any one time. And so as a result, he can punish prisoners when he observes them breaking the law. That's the punishment part. But most of the time, they self-discipline because they don't know whether they're being observed or not. And so in anticipatory obedience, they don't go close to the line. 
and I think that's a lot of what happens on social mm -hmm. media today, right? So, 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 so Foucault, I think, would have hated a lot about this political moment. And then the mm -hmm. story really is, and and you know, you'll have to read the book to really find out the details of the story. Uh, the story uh, more is, precisely, you need to buy the book. Yeah, you need to buy, it, uh, buy it right now. Pause the podcast. Yeah. So get out your phone. You're all allowed yeah. to get out your phone because we didn't. We, we messed up, and mm -hmm. we don't have a bookseller tonight for this wonderful sold out crowd. Mm -hmm. But you can get out your phone and, and, and buy the book right now. Um, I, I agree with you that Foucault gives, uh, or postmodernism, and particularly a kind of Foucauldian, allows us to critique many of the identities that are being pushed and the power dynamics. Let's shift to the next uh, big tributary, which is postcolonial hmm. theory. And you talk about Edward Said, uh, New York's own, Columbia's own. Um, what is postcolonialism, and how does that move into the identity synthesis. Well, so that's, these post-colonial scholars, two of the most important ones, both end up at Columbia, um, Said and Gayatri Spivak, and they have uh, this dilemma because they're really attracted to postmodernism, post-structuralism in Foucault and Derrida and so on because they're giving them the tools to dismantle colonial discourses which justified the oppression of their countries. Right, But they're horrified by the apolitical nature, what they see as the apolitical nature of Foucault, by the fact that he says there's no real progress to be made, right? All he can do is to critique those discourses. When I had Noam Chomsky on my podcast, he said um, when he met Foucault in a famous debate in the early 70s, he was the most amoral, not immoral, the most amoral man I have ever met, right? And so they share something that is quiet. So they go to work trying to repoliticize Foucault. And th there's two crucial moves, crucial moves here. The first is by Edward Said, who says, all right, these discourses about the Orient help to explain how colonial power was exercised and continues to be exercised. Um, but the point is not just to recognize that, the point is to invert those discourses. What we want to do is to use discourse critique as a political tool for actually shifting power in the world. And that becomes a model for a lot of how politics works today. A lot of politics today is, you know, if you're a feminist, you might fight for abortion rights and so on, but you're also going to do a lot of politics by celebrating or critiquing the Barbie movie by arguing what is or isn't problematic. Well, right? and, and, and that's true across not just families, but across a whole set of social movements. That's a lot of how we do politics today. That is Said's politicized form of discourse analysis. That's his response to Foucault. And he also, and I, I think this is you know incredibly meaningful that he talked about that discourse is not just political discourse, it's, it takes place at the cultural level. And so you know, in its kind of most abstruse form, the novels of Jane Austen or the Bronte sisters is actually kind of softening the ground for a colonial, a colonialist understanding of the other and making it okay to treat them in a particular way, which gives rise to endless uh, discussions of Barbie, right, as, as a meaningful cultural phenomenon, which I gotta say, I, you know, my background's in literary and cultural studies, so I'm all for that. But oftentimes, well, and in a way, it's, it's easy to make fun of it, but of course, it's turned out over the last 10 years that those forms of politics are very effective. Yeah. So, in a way, the victory of this form of politics has been self validating. I think 15 years ago, it would have been easy to sneer at it and say, ha ha ha, these people think we're gonna change the world by saying that this movie is problematic. Right. But but I think actually that has turned out to be quite a powerful way of doing politics. So we should there's, use yeah, that there's a reason why Vaclav Havel called his revol he named the peaceful revolution in Czechoslovakia after a rock band, not right. after a political right. theorist, right? So yeah. So the next step is Gayatri Spivak, and she's saying, look, so 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 Said has been helpful, but there's still this problem that um, postmodernists have his critique of identity categories. And philosophically speaking, I buy this. Philosophically speaking, I agree that to say well, women have something in common is overly centralizing and wrong. We should be skeptical about that. But you know what? Foucault and, and, and Deleuze really pissed me off when they had this interview where they say, you know, intellectuals shouldn't speak for people anymore. You know, the workers can speak for themselves. And Spivak said, well, that might be true of white workers in Paris who've had an education, who have voting rights and so on. It might not be true of the most disadvantaged, which calls the subaltern in places like Kolkata in India where she's from. Somebody's got to speak for them, and I want to speak for them. So how am I going to do that? And she comes up with this very paradoxical term called strategic essentialism. We said, look, philosophically speaking, the, the critique of essentialist identity categories is right, but for strategic political purposes, we sometimes have to act as though it were true. And sometimes I choose therefore not to be universalist, but an essentialist. That idea of strategic essentialism, which she herself admits is paradoxical, mm. 
ends up being super influential. When you go to a progressive space today, people will say, well, of course, race is a social construct. Something broadly speaking, I think is right, right? It's not actually a biological reality. Right? But then they'll go on to say that for all intents and purposes, we should think about race as being uh, the absolute defining thing in society. And we should want it to continue to be in certain ways. And we're gonna split you up into uh, different groups depending on the color of your skin and so on. That is strategic essentialism in a, in a, in a popularized, perhaps vulgarized form in action. And then uh, critical race theory, how does that fit into this? Um, so then you have the application of these ideas to American law schools in a tradition called critical legal studies, which is uh, saying, you know, we used to think that uh, judges decide based on these fine points of doctrine, but a lot of it is their ideologies or their self-interest. It's a kind of postmodern critique of the law. And within that, you start having people who say, well, that's great, but uh, critical legal studies itself has a big blind spot and that's race. And so what does it look like when we have that same analysis on race? And the key founder of this tradition is a man called Derek Bell, who does heroic work in the 1960s, um, working for the NAACP, helping to uh, desegregate schools throughout the American South, uh, but comes to think of that work as in many ways a mistake. Um, in some understandable ways, he says, some of the students, uh, you know, who we argue on behalf of, by the time that we win the court case, they've graduated. So then they don't get a benefit from the school being integrated and so on. But he embraces in his first big academic article um, a theory which he acknowledges explicitly comes from segregationist senators, which is that all of those civil rights lawyers claim to argue for their clients, but really they're serving two masters. And the master they're really serving is that of integrationist ideals that often don't help black people. And so therefore we should reject many of the universal institutions of the United States, from key parts of the Constitution to Brown versus Board of Education. Perhaps separate but equal would actually have been better. Because there's no way of overcoming racism in America, because the country, by the year 2000, briefly before, Bell passes away, still as racist as it ever was, the only way we can make progress is to rip those institutions up and make how you're treated more explicitly depend on the kind of group of which you are a part. And then um, intersectionality is another part of critical race theory. Uh, talk a bit about that. Yeah, so that's the last step. Um, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw recognizes, you know, at, at, at the beginning, this idea of intersectionality is what in the social sciences we know as an interaction effect. Mm -hmm. um, it's simply the recognition that the discrimination you might experience as a black woman is not just an arithmetic sum of a discrimination faced by uh, white women or black men, it might go beyond that. And she has some great examples of how that was the case in a General Motors factory in Michigan and so on. Uh, and that was an important recognition. Yeah. And, and uh, also on a, on a more kind of I, I don't want to say banal, it's, I'm being banal, not Crenshaw, the idea that we have overlapping identities that don't fully define us, but kind of stack together or whatever, you know, we call ourselves, you know, Americans, you know, Brooklyn-born, Catholic, Jewish, whatever, that, that... Yeah, there's a kind of weird Martin yeah. Bailey going on there, right, yeah. where, where the, mod, the kind of straightforward interpretation of this is again, what social scientists know is an interaction effect, or knowing that like it's not, you know, like you have multiple identities, and they both help to determine who you are, right? And that makes mm -hmm. sense. What becomes of that idea, and Crenshaw herself is somewhat critical of that, right. so it's not entirely to be blamed for this, is a much more far-reaching set of ideas, where you're saying, look, um, if you're at a different intersection of identities than me, then I really cannot fully understand you. Um, and therefore, to have effective political action, it's not a matter of me listening to you and us having solidarity and getting on the same page. It's a matter of saying, look, I don't, I, I don't understand you, but you're more oppressed than I am, so I'm going to defer to you mm -hmm. in your judgment about what to do. And that becomes a very common progressive theme. And then the other idea is that since all forms of oppression are interlinked, if you want to be in good standing fighting against a particular cause, you have to fight against all forms of oppression at the same time. So you want to join a feminist organization, you also have to agree with its view on uh, housing against development. And you also have to agree with its view on the Israel-Palestine conflict. And you also have to agree with its view on trans issues and so on and so forth. There's, there's a fantastic moment in uh, 2015 when Bernie Sanders was uh, making a campaign stop. He was running for president in Seattle. And 
up to this point, Bernie was like, you know, he was a class warrior. He believed that class was the most important category. And he literally got upstaged by a couple of Black Lives Matter activists who almost pushed him off the stage. But he retreated from the stage and then came out with a new improved agenda, which through racial issues or Black Lives Matter's concerns on top of the race. And I always think of that when you talk about kind of ceding ground to the people who seem to have the moral high ground based on oppression. Yeah, and so, 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 so I think, you know, going back to how should we understand the history of these ideas, I, don't, I just don't think cultural Marxism gives you very much about where we are today. I think the ideas we've just talked through does give you a lot of where we are today. Not every quote unquote woke person, not every progressive believes every single one of those ideas, but together they constitute so many themes of our uh, left-wing politics today, right? So is skepticism about objective truth and universal values from Michel Foucault. A embrace of this politicized form of discourse critique as the key way of doing politics from Said. An embrace of strategic essentialism which leads to things like the progressive separatism we see in schools of people being split into different groups on the basis of race that comes from uh, Spivak. Um, the skepticism about our ability to make any kind of progress, the permanence of racism, as Bell puts it, and the embrace of these race-sensitive public policies of equity over equality that uh, f is downstream from Bell. Mm. And then this interpretation of intersectionality as we really can't understand each other, and so to make common cause, I have to defer to you if you're in the more oppressed group. That, I think, helps to explain a lot of what's happened over the last 10 years. Yeah, talk a little bit about what happened. How do you define, I mean, you, you've sketched that out. What are some of the concrete effects, you know, say that we see in corporations? Uh, you know, let's start with that. What, yeah. how, how does this stuff play out in, in a big corporation? Well, let me give you a few examples. Um, you know, what people go to usually on this topic is kind of cancel culture stuff. And I've written about this. I've written about a Latino electrician in San Diego who was fired from his job in the summer of 2020 because somebody falsely thought that his hand dangling out of his truck was the OK symbol, which somehow was a white supremacist symbol according to some idiots in 4chan. And he lost his job, which was the best job he ever had. So those stories are real, and I worry about that. I worry about the fact that sometimes I have lunch with friends or I have lunch with you know, CEOs or, 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 or senators or important people, and they say the kind of thing we've been saying in this conversation, and when they add, of course, I would never say this publicly. And I worry about what that means for our country and for our trust in the institution. So all of that is real, but this is not a book about cancel culture. It's not a book about those stories, because I actually think this ideology often has much more consequential impact. So let me give you two examples. One is uh, a, a lady I spoke to in researching for this book called Kyla Posey, an African-American educator in the suburbs of Atlanta, who uh, wanted to request a particular teacher for her uh, daughter, who was, I believe, in second grade. And the principal said, sure, of course, send me over the name. She did, and then was like, ah, well, mm, she kept deferring and saying, Could, couldn't you teach, choose a different teacher? Um, and eventually, Kalaposi got annoyed and said, look, what's going on? Why can't I have my, 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 the, the teacher that I think is right for my kid? And the principal said, well, that's not the black class. Now, you might think this is straight up racism, you know, segregation, the American South. This principal herself was a black woman uh, and a progressive. And she believed that for the right kind of uh, development of a child as a racial being, she has to be in an environment with a lot of same race people. Even if she's well integrated in her class, uh, that's not good enough. She's got to go to the class where the other black kids are, right? Uh, and, and we see that take place in many different contexts. You know, we are recording this in New York City, not far from here um, uh, at Dalton School. They, they have embraced the idea that uh, kids should think of themselves as racial beings in order to understand the world in the right way. At, at Bank Street School, uh, for kids on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, you take a different subway line up there, uh, they do uh, racial affinity groups, and they explicitly say not only that they want the black kids and Latino kids to, in the spirit of strategic essentialism, have a form of ethnic solidarity, which is understandable at least, um, they say the white kids need to own their European heritage, need to define themselves more strongly as white. 
Um, Europe, of course, is a uh, historically unified continent. Right? <laughs> uh, As we're seeing right now, it's not like there's been any wars in uh, Europe yeah. recently. Can I ask, I mean, you know, and the Marxist libertarian, I'm not only, a, you know, I'm, I'm very incoherent, I'm a libertarian, I'm a postmodernist, and I'm prone to Marxian class analysis. Is that a good thing that the children of the elites in New York are being taught completely stupid things because it makes <laughs> the rest of us and our kids who may not have quite the same number of advantages just outperform them in the real world. Well, no, because actually what it takes now to succeed in many elite institutions is to have been habituated into paying lip service to these ideas in an uncritical way. Um, you know, my, my students who I teach are wonderful students and they're very thoughtful but and they that's do at worry Johns and Hopkins down in Baltimore. Yes, I, I yeah. Teach it, yeah. Um, uh, but they do worry and complain that some of the professors they have, um, you know, it's very clear that you have to agree with a politics in order to get a good grade. Um, so you know, but but that the thing I really may worry well about go back to you know, Bologna or whatever the first uh, university was. Right? Perhaps, yeah. perhaps I, you know. But 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 here's my real worry, which is that everything I know from history and social science teaches me that. Um, how you define yourself is very context dependent. Mm -hmm. There's many different ways of defining yourself. But once you define yourself by a particular group, and you see this again and again in social science experiment, if, if I get my students to debate whether or not a hot dog is a sandwich, the kids who think that a hot dog is a sandwich discriminate against the kids who think that a hot dog is not a sandwich. Mm -hmm. So if you tell those kids, we're going to put you in a white group and we're going to lecture you about white privilege and how bad white people are, they might be uncomfortable, and I don't care they're uncomfortable. You can be uncomfortable sometimes in your education, that's fine. But if you actually succeed in making them think the most important thing about me is that I'm white, a few of them might become great Ibram X. Kendi-style anti-racists who want to denounce white privilege. Most of them are going to become white supremacists. Right. And that's actually my concern. Let's talk a little bit about your identity, and then I want to talk about how we get out of this, and then we'll open it up to... Uh, questions from the audience. <clears throat> you write at the beginning in the, uh, it's not quite the first chapter, but it's kind of the beginning. You say, all four of my grandparents were sent to prison for their communist beliefs during the 1920s or 30s. It's an interesting- And why would they be proud that I'm a libertarian speakeasy? Yeah, that's, you know, so it's like, this is progress, right? You know, thank you, Hegel. Um, but um, you know, you you were born in Germany. You grew up there, and then you came to the United States. Can you give us a, a quick capsule biography? Uh, sure. And leave the sex stuff out. That's in, <laughs> that's in your book, The Identity Trap. We don't need to go through that now. All the details. No. Um, so yeah, my, my my I mean, you know, my 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 ancestors were in the wrong place at the wrong time for a, a large number of generations. Um, and uh, my, my grandparents were born in shtetls in okay. uh, what today is Ukraine. Um, and for understandable reasons, they uh, uh, you know, became communists because in their context, um, that's the ideology that promised, falsely as it turns out, uh, a form of solidarity across religious and other groups, mm -hmm. right? Something where the workers of the world would unite and the fact that they were Jewish and their neighbors were not wouldn't mean that they might suffer pogroms. Mm -hmm. um, they went in prison in the 30s for advocating those beliefs, survived the Holocaust in the Soviet Union, came back to Poland to help build up the communist regime, and when lo and behold, the communist regime turned on them mm -hmm. and threw them out, and threw my parents, who were 18, 20, uh, out as well, and so I ended up uh, growing up in in Germany, going to school. What year there. were you born? 1982. Okay, so you you don't really remember, uh, you know, pre fall of the wall. No, I have a memory of a Berlin Wall falling, but oddly, I have a memory watching this on TV in a house that we didn't live in until I was mm. uh, until after 1989. So. Clearly, something's wrong. Well, it's all a simulation, so you know. But that's Baudrillard, not for yeah. Now. I think yeah. you know that there was weird explosives yeah. at the wall. It was so all the hoax. How did um, you, um, you, uh, how did you go from you know that to uh, being who you are today? Um, I I knew that I wanted to study outside of Germany, mm. um, in part because I wanted an adventure internationally, in part because uh, you know I. England had better universities, and I was attracted to that, in part because growing up Jewish in Germany, I experienced some of the social norms 
that I think later made me allergic to some of the stuff in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, when I was born in 1982, there was about 30,000 Jews left in Germany. I don't know, it was a little bit more after 1989, 1990, but most of the people I grew up with had never met a Jew. And so to them, uh, you know, I was the whole uh, representation of their complicated past. And depending how they felt about the past, they felt about me. And so sometimes I got anti-Semitism and so on, and that was unpleasant, but you could kind of deal with it. You think, screw you, you know, there's nothing wrong with me. But I also got this really creepy philo-Semitism a lot mm. of the time, where people tried to prove to me uh, how much they love the Jews, mm. or like tell me that Hebrew is a beautiful language. <laughs> At the time, oh, you, either, and, like, you know, Germans know beautiful languages, right, when they hear them. Well, I mean, but compared yeah. to German, surely yeah. Hebrew is a beautiful language. Yeah. Um, at the time, uh, this was a less controversial statement. They, they would tell me how much they love the, movie, the movies of Woody Allen. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. Anyway, and so I think that's actually part of when I saw some similar norms and customs uh, entering the social space where I was in the States, where suddenly rather than being the representative of victims, I became oh. the representative of perpetrators. I thought I hated being treated in this way, and I don't want to treat others. Why did you come way. to the United States? Because I love New York. Yeah. And then I basically never fully, hey, yes, yeah. so cheer for New York. Um, and then I like came here and I did a year at Columbia and I didn't take any classes. Said had just passed away. I didn't take any classes with Spivak. I guess I should have done. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then I ended up doing my PhD at Harvard and teaching in other places. And I've always like half lived in New York, but I never actually had a professional reason to be in New York. What, what do you like about New York? Um, I think a lot of... What I loved at the time and still love is... The crime. It's, it's the, the rents. Yeah. It's the high rents. Um, They're quite magnificent. I saw a comedian the other day who said, you know, stop complaining about the high rents. You really have to do something about it. If you think the rents are too high, go stab somebody. <laughs> <laughs> if someone stabs me, I wouldn't, I wouldn't complain and say, thank you for your service. Um, <laughs> but it was not my joke, sadly. <laughs> Um, no, it's 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 that I think in New York you 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 could at a certain time and you still can not be defined by who you are. Mm -hmm. I think there's something about New York that celebrates influences from all over the world and encourages people to be true to that, to be proud of their cultural heritage. And yet, there are so many different ways in which cultures meet. I, I, I guess what I'm saying in, in the terms of one of the chapters in the later part of a book mm -hmm. where I talk about uh, this topic is that New York is the world capital of cultural appropriation. Right, and I love it about it. No, uh, well, let's talk about that, and um, and you know, move into how do we get out of the situation we're in? I think a lot of people you talk in the book, a lot of people are pessimists. Um, certainly, you know, people on the right have their own issues, but people on the left are pessimists. They can't acknowledge progress on any level. I think the right also does that in different ways. Um, how do we get out of the kind of broad-based cultural funk that we're in, that you know, cultural appropriation is everywhere and it's bad, that identity is simultaneously completely protean, and so we, we're all borderline personalities, but then we also have these essential fixed qualities that we means we can never communicate with one another. Well, I think a lot of it is that we have to win the argument. Mm -hmm. and, and to win the argument, you have to take the ideas seriously and actually understand them and then argue against them, right? So I was joking about cultural appropriation, mm. but I think it's an important topic. So I have, so mostly we've talked about part one of the book was about the intellectual history. In part two, I explain how these ideas come to be powerful. And then in part three, I criticize the main applications to areas from free speech to race sensitive public policies. But let's take cultural appropriation as one example, right? There's come to be this general suspicion, this general taboo about mutual cultural influence, that there's something potentially dangerous and unjust about it, and I get where that comes from because there's some examples of so-called cultural appropriation that were clearly unjust, like white musicians stealing the songs of black musicians in the 50s and 60s when they couldn't have big careers. The problem is that the term of cultural appropriation fails to express what was wrong about that situation or how we could have had a remedy. What was wrong is not this musical style gaining an influence and gaining a broader audience, that was beautiful. What was wrong was the horrible discrimination, outright discrimination that those black musicians suffered, which meant that they couldn't travel across the South, perform in many concert halls, be signed by major record labels. That was, that's what was unjust, and that's what we should have done in order to remedy that, tackle that problem. I give the example of a 
uh, fraternity party at Baylor University with the uh, unpleasant name of Cinco de Drinco, um, <laughs> in which you had kids, mostly white, turn up, some in ponchos and sombreros, others in construction vests and maids' outfits. Hmm. Now, this is clearly offensive. But according to the concept of cultural appropriation, you can't actually pick out what philosophers call the wrong-making feature of this situation. Because from the perspective of cultural appropriation, the kids who turned up in ponchos did something horrible, but the kids who turned up in maids' outfits didn't do anything wrong, because the maids' outfit is not part of Mexican culture. It's, if anything, I guess, part of French culture. So they weren't appropriating the culture, right? That's clearly absurd. What was wrong here is that these students were trying to send the message that Latinos are less than, that all the good for is to be maids or construction workers, or there's something to be poked fun at. And so we should defend mutual cultural influence as one of the beautiful things about New York, as one of the beautiful things about America, and not give in to this idea that there should be a general pole of suspicion on ways to influence each other culturally. How would you deal with that? You know, let's say you're a college administrator. Let's say everything goes wrong for you and you end up a college administrator. <laughs> and you're not I would allowed rather to leave be, the country and go back to Germany or Ukraine or... Uh, I, would, I would rather be, and please, if I ever become a dean, uh, quote this line back to me and, you know, take me out yeah. in an alleyway and shoot me. Um, okay, you've got a lot I would rather ways. be a general, you know, you know, a regional manager of Trader Joe's than the, deeds yeah. are, the dean of social science. Yeah, speaking of cultural Radar appropriation. Universe. At least you can right? fire and hire people, but, you know, as a dean, what, you have what, no power to how, do anything. It's the worst, you know, and everybody hates you. It's the worst job in the world. In a in a pragmatic sense, like how how do you deal with a situation like that? If you you know on a college campus, Baylor is you know is a good school. Uh, it's a Christian school. It's a Baptist school. How do you explain to people like maybe that's not the greatest idea? I mean, I think, uh, I don't know, in this particular case, it depends on the particular rules of the student handbook and so on. I assume that they didn't break any technical mm -hmm. rules. Um, I think that this is something that students can also handle among themselves. I think it's perfectly appropriate that there would be some kind of social repercussions for the kids who took part in that. But a lot of people tell them, hey, you did something terrible. Um, I'm not sure that, uh, uh, you know, this is something that the administration needs to get involved. It's one of the strange things that students who claim to be rebels today, the first act of rebellion is to call a college administrator. Hmm. That's not something that anybody in the 60s would afford you should do. Right. right. But, but, but let me perhaps speak, uh, because I feel like I gave a slightly narrow answer to your question earlier. You know, here's the, here's the broadest level at which to argue against this ideology. Hmm. I talked you through some of the main themes of, of the identity synthesis, um, but you can also step back and boil it down to what I think are its three main philosophical propositions. And those are number one, that um, the key prism to understand the world is uh, race, gender, and sexual orientation. That is the thing you always have to look at in any situation to understand what's going on. And Robin if I may, it's fascinating. When I was in grad school studying literature uh, from the late 80s to the mid 90s, the prisms were race, class, and gender. Everything was, we're going to look at the race, class, and gender implications of stuff. And it's fascinating class kind of dropped out of that. Yeah, sometimes people pay lip service to it, but when you talk, uh, look at what they actually pay attention to and actually talk about, it's very, very rare. Nobody wants to The be same is true of religion. Sometimes people academic. say religion, but religion yeah. only matters when it's correlated with race. Right. So religion matters in the Muslim context in the United States because Muslim people, by and large, are non-white in the United States. Of course, there are white Muslims as well, but that's sort of how it's seen, right? Um, but it doesn't matter in context where it's not correlated with a minority yeah. ethnic group. Um, so that's number one, right? That's how you have to see the world. Number two is um, universal principles like the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, like, like the 14th Amendment, like uh, 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 even some civil rights legislation is actually meant to pull the wool over your eyes. It is meant to make it easier to cloak and to justify the continuation of various forms of racial, sexual, and so on, dominance and discrimination. And that is why America today is as homophobic, as sexist, as racist, as whatever is, as it was in the past. That's the second key claim. And then the third claim is that therefore, since we haven't made progress under these universal values, you have to rip them up and substitute it with a regime where how we treat each other and how the state treats all of us will always explicitly depend on the group of which we're 
apart. Now, I think that's very good philosophically liberal, I'm going to say, to bridge the space between you libertarians and me right. squishy, you know, center-left liberal. Um, uh, there's a very good response to each of these claims. And that response is number one, that of course race, gender, and sexual orientation matter in some context. Of course there's contexts where that's very important, including in the United States today in general. But it is not the only thing that matters. Instead of looking at the world with just one prism, as Marxists did, just looking at class, and now we're doing just with these kind of identity categories, you have to let the situation teach you how to interpret it. We shouldn't, in the words of Jonathan Haidt, be monomaniacal in how we perceive the world. Yes, race, gender, sexual orientation matters. Yes, class matters. Yes, religion matters. Yes, our individual attributes matters. How we act matters. What our aspirations are matter. You have to let the situation teach you. Robin DiAngelo, the sort of worst popularizer of all of these ideas, has once said that um, every time that a white person interrupts a black person, they're bringing the entire apparatus of white supremacy to bear on them. That makes me think that Robin DiAngelo doesn't have any black friends. Mm. Because, of course, this can sometimes be true in certain contexts. It was certainly true in the 19th century in all kinds of contexts. But it's not true if your best friends who argue about politics and interrupt each other all the time. Then that's a sign of equality. right? Secondly, it is profoundly untrue that the universal liberal values we've been talking about have failed to m allow us to make progress. You know, Frederick Douglass called free speech the dread of tyrants, recognizing that it allowed people to say awful things in his day, but it also allowed abolitionists, when they were very unpopular, to fight for their ideals. Yeah, he uh, also gave a great speech, uh, What to the Slave is the 4th of July, but called the Constitution a glorious freedom document. He said, you all are hypocrites sitting here celebrating the Constitution, celebrating the Declaration of Independence, saying, isn't it lovely when there's slavery in our country? But he didn't say, therefore, rip up those values. He said, so if you mean it, live up to them. Hmm. This document is glorious. It hasn't become reality. And in that sense, liberalism or libertarianism or whateverism is a progressive creed, right? We're not saying everything is great. We're saying we have the right principles. Now it's time to live up to them. And the aspiration to live up to them from Frederick Douglass to Abraham Lincoln to Martin Luther King and others is part of what has allowed us to make progress. And by the way, it's offensive to say we haven't made any progress. Not offensive to us wonderful Americans living today, but offensive to the Americans in the past who've suffered much, much worse discrimination. To say that America is as homophobic today as in the past is absurd when in the lifetime of Eunuch and me, um, Ellen DeGeneres had to leave her talk show because she admitted having a girlfriend. Yeah. Right? It's just absurd. And so and further, now she was canceled because she's a pain to work with. That's, <laughs> that's probably... That's, you know, of all the forms of cancellation, being yeah. a pain to work with, I feel like, is a fair one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the... So what do we do? Well, we, 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 we double down on trying to live up to these values. That is the, the right response. And that is what uh, you know, a huge swath of Americans actually believe. And that, by the way, is the philosophy that can make you win against the generally dangerous racists and far-right populists and so on who are a very, very real threat in our politics today. All right, we're going to stop there. Uh, this has been the Reason interview with Nick Gillespie. I want to thank tonight's guest, Yasha Monk. The book is The Identity Trap, a story of ideas and power in our time. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks.